Here we are, uh, we're going down a, an area where we've caught people drag racing in the past. And it's a dark lit road. You can't see anything. And what we look for is what would be called the starting line where you're gonna see where they heat the tires up and rubber on the roadway. See those black marks in the roadway? This is where, where people, this is what would be their launch pad. And look, there's some marks over there to your left where it looks like a car might have went off into the woods. Shake, whatever, say ready. I'm ready and right here. You know, I don't I don't yeah, want that up and down. Just yeah. ready, ready. You're gonna ask ready, ready, and then just drop. Well the way the way we race, we are not on the street trying to race light to light and that. These guys are here uh, like on Deer Park Avenue and in Farmingdale. These guys are trying to run light to light. It's the way we do it, we block off the roads and that. I'm not saying it's safe, safe, but it's more safer. Good yeah. luck, man, all right? It's an excitement, you know, people get excitement doing up, you know, bungee jumping or whatever. I get excitement racing. You have various levels of racing. They are the professionals, uh, the drag racers who are, are you know, running cars that are sponsored, much like NASCAR or Indy cars or what have you. Is that what it is? Take a look. You know, then we have the, the sort of run what you brung guys, uh, where the drag strip will open up to people who bring their street cars in and, and either just to, you know, get the, the bug out on their own to uh, see how well they can do or if they have somebody that they want to race against. Uh, then you have the people who do it on the street that uh, pose a danger to themselves and to others that are out there. And unfortunately, we've seen uh, lots of those cases end up in tragedies. I think in all cases, though, uh, it's a reflection of the fact that there is this great thrill that exists and going fast and some people are satisfying it uh, safely and legally and unfortunately some are not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, don't want to get too greedy. Nobody else wants to bet? No pressure at all. It actually feels good in that, you know? It's almost like a, almost like a fight, you know? Your body, you know, gets somewhat a little numb. You focus on what you're doing and that and it just get a high, a high. Just like people get high from drugs, I get high from racing. Does anybody want to volunteer to go out there and check for cops and sit out there until everybody comes? I'll go out there. You'll see it, it's marked off. It says race here. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while, I mean, last time you were out here, you rode the bumper down uh, Nassau Expressway, you know? Well, in most cases, like we, like we said, we block off the roads, we try to go late in the night, we're setting a quarter mile up and we're just going a quarter mile. There's no people in front of us. We close up the road. Not that ours is 100% legit, but you know what? It's much safer. I got it, I got it, I got it. As other people, as other people that do race and that, they in they in and out of traffic, just it just hundred miles an hour. Every every block you have a light. From here to that pole right there, that's when I nailed it. It spun, but I actually now shifted quick. I mean, both both of them are dangerous, but the way we do it, I think is much much safer. We do things much safer, much organized than that. This street racing that they call street racing today is um, not street racing. We stopped traffic. The cars weren't that fast. And I can't remember ever having an incident where somebody got hurt or somebody crashed or somebody got killed. These kids today are out of their minds. Cutting in and out of traffic and this and that, thinking you're, you know, Dale Earnhardt. That's not street racing. That's just being plain stupid. Street racing is illegal. There are always, there's, someone always gets hurt. 
Someone always dies. Something terrible always happens. We have to try and prevent it. We have to. Things go wrong real fast. One of the most difficult things at a job to explain to a family member that their loved one just passed away in a car crash. And um, it's just a horrible experience. It's difficult on Long Island to police these uh, events because like a lot of criminal activity, and I compared it earlier to drug dealing, when you clean up one area, it tends to move someplace else. There is a spontaneity involved. Because it happens very quickly, it happens within seconds, and then it's over within seconds. Pickup races are pickup races. That light to light, that cat and mouse. How do you police that other than having police officers on the road to intercept? I enjoy the thrill of fast things. If I go skiing, I'm going to Double Black Mountain, you know, super steep, and you know, even if I'm not qualified enough to do it. I ride motorcycles, I've driven a lot of fast cars, and you know, I do like that degree of adrenaline. I have to look in the mirror every single day. I have to go to sleep and wake up every day knowing that this is my fault. My thought process really was, you know, the worst thing that's gonna happen here, God forbid, is my dad's gonna flip out on me about me getting a speeding ticket, you know, driving 100 miles per hour. I was never thinking there's even a 1% chance that someone's gonna get hurt. You know, I admitted, I was racing, I was driving fast, I did make a mistake, I was irresponsible, I was reckless. How does that make me a murderer? You know, when the caveman made the first wheel, right? Another came and said, I like that wheel. He goes, how do you get one of those? He goes, I, uh, you gotta carve it. He carved it. Now the other caveman's got a wheel. He goes, oh, look at my wheel, right? Oh, oh, I got a big wheel. And the other caveman goes, oh yeah? Well, let's see who's as fast, right? So that's how the first drag race I believe started. You know, I don't care who it is. You line up two old ladies, my Aunt Mary would race you in a heartbeat. In my opinion, the reason why we're having street racing on, on Long Island is there's no place for them to go release their need for speed. I give it an analogy uh, of, uh, of, of baseball when I was a kid. When I was playing baseball and they locked the park up on us, we were out in the street, somebody breaks a window and why don't you go to the park? I said, we'd go to the park, but it's locked up. So the same thing here on Long Island, the street races don't have it. There's actually three tracks at one time on Long Island. You had West Hampton, Freeport, and Iceland. National Speedway closed, I think, sometimes back in the late 70s. They closed up, they announced one year, I forget the year it was, we all cried that um, they were gonna build condominiums. For many years, there was a drag strip on Long Island that we took for granted. You know, it wasn't the best, it wasn't the best maintained place. But at the same token, it was, it was still a track that we had that we called home. Long Island's got a huge, huge history of racing. You know, it dates back to the, to the early 1900s. Huge history. The Vanderbilts ran races in the 30s and 40s, I think. Drag strips, there were circle tracks, there were dirt circle tracks. There was tracks all over Long Island. There's almost none left now. Here's how the four-mile course looks from the air. Like a crooked piece of macaroni. They closed down, you know, uh, National Speedway. He sold out because the property value was more than he can make with the taxes and everything else that he can run as a business. So he sold it. Iso Speedway, it turned into a cookie factory that had all kinds. West Hampton, all of the neighbors bothered him and, you know, it was impossible for him to do business. Turn left on Oak Shade Road. Long Island's got a huge group of people that are into it. A lot of us have to travel out of Long Island, so we have to go to Jersey. We're dumping money for food and for gas and tolls in their community when this all could be, you know, income and revenue for Long Island. That's it, pretty much ready to go. I've, I've owned my car since 1985. It's a very powerful car. It's a very dangerous car if you don't know how to handle it also. So that's why I, I do take it to the track, because you can get hurt in a car like this really easily on the street. But it's got a lot of years of, of time in it, you know, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, I guess you could say, in it. And it's the same car that I've had since high school, so it's, it's been there longer than my wife.
What a run. Uh, 10.59. Off the trail, not bad. I've already been asked, you know, how much do you want for your car? And I said, it's not for sale. And they said, everything has a price. And I said, how about you give me 50 grand, I'll build you one. <laughs> I says, but mine's not for sale. Was, my, my father gave it to me, passed away 24 years ago, so. Uh, I'm gonna try and jet the carburetor, uh, go up a couple of jet sizes. What that does is it richens up the mixture, it adds more fuel. Length, lengthening the arm right. is going to soften the hit. Shorting, shortening the arm is going to make the hit more violent, which is what I want. I want to bite harder at the track. Right. Yeah, I'm self-employed. I have my own business for 24 years. Um, I don't have any real employees, so it's not like I could send guys out to do work for me. So I pretty much have to shut down my business while I'm not there. So it's not even the expense of going to the, to the track. It's the expense of losing the income for the day. And I can easily take my car on the street and test it. There's not an issue. I can easily do that, and I won't do it because I have too much to lose. And, and I want to do it the safe way and the right way, which is to go to a track. Just want to get out and beat up on my car a little bit legally so I don't do it in the street at home. I have a really good feeling if Long Island had another drag strip nowadays, it would really reduce the amount of street racing. Guys who are serious car guys, serious about racing, would benefit from a legal track. I regret to say that even if you had that track, uh, it would be a lie to think that that would stop the problem of pickup races or organized drag races between young people, really young people. If they opened up a track in, out here in Long Island, I think you'll get most, most of the people that are doing this. You're still gonna get some, but most people take they, their business more to the track. It, it certainly couldn't hurt. You're always gonna have those certain individuals who like to, to live life on the edge and uh, continue to do things illegally. Do you know, I wish that I could say that if we got a track, that anybody could race, but that's not the reality. What kind of license do you need? What kind of car do you need? What kind of insurance do you need? So I don't know if that's the answer because the people who are drag racing are 17, 18 years old. When I see it happening, what I see is I'm in the middle of a car and I look to my left and this guy looks to his right and he sees another car and they honk each other, they nod each other and they go off. That doesn't seem like oh, these two guys are gonna go meet at the track. But I think that if you really want to make an impact, that we need to take a harsher look at education and consequences. Listen to me. If you give your kid a car that is too fast for them to handle, you may as well be handing them a gun, because the reality of it is that more kids die from that than from guns and from drugs and from all of the things that we talk about. You know, street racing, drag racing, cat and mouse racing are huge problems on Long Island. And I don't know whether the issue is um, the fact that we tend to have money or the fact that we have such a, a huge population in this area that it makes it so dangerous. Uh, but anybody who lives here, anybody who works here, if you've ever been on the Long Island Expressway at night, you know that if you're traveling at 55 miles an hour, people are blowing your doors off. When you've taken a human life, it means something and it matters. And to me, the drag racing is just like drunk driving. To me, it's a choice. You got in the car, you made a decision to race. You made a decision with someone else. You've not only put yourselves at risk, but you put whoever is in your way at risk. And if we don't do something, we're gonna lose more and more youth. On my report, it says I was indicted on two counts of murder. It says that I went to prison for assault with a deadly weapon and manslaughter in the second degree, two counts of each. Day one, I knew that I committed the act of vehicular manslaughter or even assault with a deadly weapon, but I'm not a murderer. I hate to say this because it's an awful thing to say, but after business hours and like in the evening, this really is a perfect strip to race on because there's no lights, there's no stop signs, there's no pedestrians, there's no houses on, on this road. It's just literally a highway. Such awful memories of this place such awful memories of this scene. The truth is, without this situation happening, 
If I only got a ticket that night and never got into an accident and people didn't die, I'll tell you right now, I would still be doing that. You know, I've been in law enforcement for 30 years, but the fact is that the only laws that you really can't break are the laws of physics, and you cannot stop that car. This is the last 10 seconds. Drag racing didn't exist, I don't know if, if my dad could live, you know what I'm saying? He would literally go crazy if, if we couldn't race cars. There's a natural, evolutionarily primed response in our bodies called the fight or flight response. Your brains tell your adrenal glands, release adrenaline, blood flows to our muscles, our pupils dilate. And at that time, our brains are releasing chemicals called these endogenous opioids. And those endogenous opiates are much like morphine that is made by our own body. Now just put your foot where the starting line is going to be. So the excitement in street racing is tenfold of the excitement at the drag strip. Because of the anticipation of the cops coming, because of the tight area that you're racing in, because of the danger, I guess, and because of what could go wrong very easily. What is going to happen when they begin this drag race? They simply don't know the outcome, and not knowing that outcome is even more pleasurable for them. Still 30. Leave it there. It's okay. good there. I didn't move it. I just tightened oh, it. I yeah, wanted to okay. make sure it didn't move. It's good. Ten years ago, we were on the parkway, and you know, zoom, here comes this car, come flying by me, cut me off, cut the next guy off, this and that, and then another car right behind him, zoom, same thing, and Vincent said to me, is that, is that what you used to do? Is that the street racing you used to do? And he's like, no, Vincent, that's definitely not what we used to do. No, Vincent, that's stupidity. Those guys are gonna end up on their roof, not 10 miles down the road, come up to a traffic jam. One of those two cars that came flying by us was on its roof. Ever since then, I knew that's not what my father used to do and how dangerous street racing could actually be. John Gadosh and Vincent Nobile going to be the next two. Well, now Vincent's a professional. He races a professional class in NHRA Pro Stock. He's one of the most feared kids out there. He's the only feared kid out there. Do I wish I grew up in my father's era? Without a doubt, you know, it's just, from the stories he tells, it was just so much fun and things are so much different than they were back in the day when my father did it. For one, there's a whole lot more traffic on the road. And, now, and nowadays you have everybody texting and driving. Don't get me wrong, I love racing professionally. But to be able to experience what he did back in the day had to have been exhilarating. This is the one that's a real dagger. Um, June 10th, 2002. We were all being macho about our fancy cars and, you know, being snobby, obnoxious kids that were, you know, spoiled and privileged. You know, he was driving the Corvette, you know, I was driving my Mercedes. We only had to like switch lanes and maneuver out of the way of one vehicle because it was 1040 at night during the summer and it's just like a country road basically. My car is at a maximum speed. There's, it's not going to get higher. Start decelerating and you know realizing I gotta make a turn soon. By the time that I had the chance to put my foot on the brake, I was already un unconscious.
eventually they told me in the hospital that there was another car and it was an engaged couple that came here from Haiti for a better life. Unfortunately, Sophia Bertus and John Desir, um, I'll never forget their names. I, I literally, the first tattoo I ever got in my entire life is a memorial piece with their initials on a tombstone like from that night because I want to always give them a, a chance to have a piece of living skin to go on for as long as I can go on for. They were supposed to get married on August 3rd. The wedding was completely ready, planned. And um, one of the hardest things we had to do was change a wedding to a funeral. She never got to wear her wedding dress. She was buried in her wedding dress. I am an, obviously I'm as remorseful as a human being could be. I would chop off my arms and my legs right now and then go to prison for 100 years if I can bring them back. I think if I were to sit down with Blake today, I think I'd be okay. I think that I would tell him that I've, forgiveness is not mine to give, but I can tell you that I'm not angry with him, that I've let it go, that I recognize it was an error of youth and that I hope he learned from it and I hope that the, carrying the burden of someone's death isn't a burden that's too heavy for him. I, I don't wish that for him. And that um, if he's learned how to live with it, I'm pleased for him, that I would be pleased for him. We want to welcome all our street uh, races here. These guys come out with street legal cars. They have to be street legal with four DOT tires. And here's one of our street races that we dragged off the street and brought to the track. I wanted a drag race so bad that I, I saw this track come up for sale and I bought it. Gino comes from Pittsburgh and travels three and a half hours to race here at South Mountain Raceway. One of the best tracks south, eight mile track is where it's at. You can see the burnout, you can see the leave, and there's Gino. Wow, that's some fast machine there. One of the things that a track owner needs, heart. And I have the heart. I love drag racing. It, it changed it, it saved my life. It actually saved my life. You know, because uh, I would have probably been out doing something stupid. Drag racing is not weaving in and out, cutting people off, driving like an idiot. A lot of times they'll label that in the newspaper and on the, on the news and it really makes a bad name for people like me and I think that's what happened on Long Island it makes people think that drag racing is such a bad thing and this is it this is paradise here this is beautiful and I'd love to get a house out here and freaking have have some place that we can go on the weekends and maybe hang out here we've built parks for kids to get them out of the malls from the skateboards. We, we built places for young kids uh, that were playing baseball on the street to go to a baseball diamond. We, we have these places designed for these kids, but then when they reach a certain age and they get cars and their freedom, we totally neglect the fact that there needs to be a facility somewhere nearby for them to take those cars and some sort of a program to educate them on the responsibility of driving those cars. On Long Island, we need those safe places to race and we don't have that. I started Street to Strip in uh, 2005. I saw a problem on the television the, with the uh, rampant street racing that was going on and it had reached epidemic proportions. So um, I went and talked to a couple of police officers and they said, you know, maybe we should get something going, start a program. I'll go out on a Friday or Saturday night. We'll go to all of the spots and we just find all of the places where they hang out like they're, they're not hard to find you'll see them all lined up there uh, I will just try to talk to some of them hey what are you doing uh, hey how would you like to sign up for our program maybe uh, how would you like to race a cop or something let me ask you a question if if the drag strip was open on a Friday night you know till midnight that'd be, what's that that'd be awesome did you hear that that'd be awesome You've lost your license for reckless behavior, a DUI, eluding police, whatever, nonviolent offense. And so York County Probation will send me six young males to this program for that. And they'll go through a two week, pretty intensive program. So he'll sign them up and say, if you're interested, channel that energy into something positive. 
Well, I can tell you, if I, when I was a kid, I would have loved to have done something like this. Like I said, I did that kind of street racing thing, and there was nothing like this for me when I was a kid. When I got involved in Cowboys program as a police officer, uh, the very first year I did it, I was in an actual police car and I raced kids. I lined up on the, on the lights, the lights changed and off I went. And I'll tell you what, that was the most awesome thing I think I've done in a long time. There's no 100% success rate, but our success rate has been very good. And that's evident by the fact that guys who have been through this drag school continue to come back in successive years to talk to new classes. They don't have to come back. They're not on probation anymore. They've moved on in life, but yet they come back to talk to another generation of young guys that got in trouble with the law as they did. That's success. I don't care if you have driver's ed going to the schools and stuff, it's not enough. Nobody goes to talk to them about if they have an interest in speed, and there needs to be that in schools all across the country. Tonight, a teenager on Long Island faces charges of manslaughter. Well, say that deadly wreck was triggered by a drag race. And, and now a grand jury has been. Were, were you drag racing those other kids? So that's Corey Glow was silent on his way to court this afternoon. The 18-year-old farming jail man was indicted today in connection with a gruesome accident on Conklin Street last May that left five of his friends dead. Five teenagers in the other car. Five teenagers lost their lives, 14 years old. I just, you know, our daughter had tremendous potential. But then again, so did those other kids. We don't know what they were capable of because their lives were cut short. You'll see a, a big crash, a horrific crash, or uh, maybe it's just one teenager, but the type of crash that it was. Everybody's up in arms, and the community, and the, and the town leaders, and we're going to do something, we're gonna, we need to address this. But then, it all dies down and goes away. And the only people left with the hurt and the pain and the memories are the families. He was young, he did stupid things, but he needs to know you cannot do these things. You can't go out and take a car and decide to have fun with it and, and make it a potential weapon. Why does it make you upset? Why does it make me upset? Yes. Yes. My niece isn't here anymore. My niece's life equated to 23 days of his time. Unacceptable. A few bucks, slap on the wrist, get a good lawyer. You can get away with a lot in this country, obviously that our children were left there, and the Milases were left there. No value to their lives. It didn't mean anything to Mr. Glow. There are no winners here. The loss of life hangs heavy in the air. This isn't an us against them. We're all together. This was a terrible tragedy. This was, uh, it'll never leave me. And I think, uh, I hope they know that. Well, you know, street racing and all that speed, it's not going away with this Fast and Furious and all that kind of thing, those movies, it, they make it look like it's something everybody walks away from. It's not. For me personally, it's, you know, it's May 10th every day. Every day that I leave work and I'm on my way home, I cry because I know I'm going through the door and she's not there. I mean, we were so intertwined. She was my, the other half of me. What were some of Carly's ambitions? What did she Oh, God, she had so many. Uh, I'm about the plane she, she, she talked about being president of the United States. Uh, I'm about the One of the things that she talked about all the time about was, you know, having six children. You know, something that's something I'll never have now. I'll never have grandchildren. I'll never, we always talked about her first car. That's not going to happen. There's a no wedding. prom. Wedding. A graduation. Walking it down the aisle. You can't, you can't do it over, you know what I mean? You know, if I could do one thing, if my wife and I could do one thing, and just to save another parent from ever having to go through this, I'd give my life for that. I really would. You know, and I would trade places with my daughter in a heartbeat. You're not supposed to bury your children. It's not supposed to be like that. 